Good morning. My name is Blanca Beato and I am the microclimate team leader of Peace Rio Test. Welcome to this webinar on thermal comfort, which is part of the series of webinars on indoor environmental quality that Bistria has prepared and which you can find and download for free on the Bistria web. We're going to start today by introducing the concept of thermal comfort, and then we're going to continue with the measurements and instrumentation that we have to take to measure thermal comfort. We're going to talk about the results of thermal comfort or the thermal comfort indices. And then I'm going to show you some examples where Bistria has calculated thermal comfort. And finally, we're going to sum up this presentation. Right, so to start, we're going to give a brief introduction of what thermal comfort is. Thermal comfort is the condition of mind that expresses satisfaction with the thermal environment and is assessed by subjective evaluation. Dissatisfaction with the environment can be caused by feeling too hot or too cold, if we take into consideration the whole of the body, or also by having the feeling of cooling or heating in a particular part of the body, which is known as local discomfort. Due to individual differences, it is impossible to specify a thermal environment that will satisfy everybody. In the next section, we're going to see how to measure thermal comfort. There are two standards that relate to thermal comfort, and they are both based on the work that Professor Olaf Hanger from the University of Denmark carried out. He investigated thermal comfort, um, experimented um, his results with a very large number of uh, volunteers, and um, the standards were developed. So the first standard you can see here is BSEN ISO 7730. And this one explains the calculation of thermal comfort. And the standard 7726 deals with the instrumentation and the calculation of the different temperatures and humidities, uh, humidity and um, air velocity and the instrumentation that you have to, you have to use. Um, these are the two standards that we normally use at Bistria, but also, ASHRAE 55 is another standard based on, on thermal comfort. Both standards were developed in, in parallel and they refer to the moderate environment. There are also other standards that deal with extreme cold or extreme hot environments if you need more information on, on those. Right, so to measure thermal comfort, involves a little bit more than measuring the temperature and measuring the humidity, although these are two parameters that we have to measure. The other parameters that we have to measure are the air temperature, the air speed, the turbulence intensity, and the globe temperature, as, as you can see here, uh, using a black globe. Or uh, if you're not measuring the black globe uh, temperature, you can measure the operative temperature using this sensor that looks like a, like a microphone instead. And uh, you have to apply slightly different calculations, but you can still obtain the thermal comfort indices. So what you can see here also in white is the humidity sensor. And what you can see here is an anemometer that uh, has a a shield, a metal shield, and this is just to protect the, the anemometer. And this anemometer measures the air temperature and the air speed as well. So before I start talking about the thermal comfort indices, I would like to mention that in order to calculate thermal comfort, we have to take into consideration the clothes that a person is going to wear and also the metabolic rate. So to start with the clothes, the clothes that we wear provide thermal insulation. So obviously we will not feel the same in an environment if we were in summer clothes or if we were in winter clothes complete with hat and gloves and scarf. So the standard 7730 has clothing levels for several scenarios, including daily wear and work wear. These are only some, some examples of what you can find there. And uh, there is also a list of individual clothing components. So if you cannot find exactly 
uh, what the design is for, you can always add up the clothing levels for each, each component individually. And the next thing to take into consideration before calculating the thermal comfort indices is the metabolic rate. So the metabolic rate gives us an indication of the activity that we are carrying out. And um, as you can imagine, a person will not feel the same in, in the same environment if, for example, they are sitting down or if they are running. Um, so in, in an office environment, we probably would have a, a metabolic rate rate of 1.0 or 1.2, which is equivalent to a sedentary activity, because in an office we're not, we're not normally getting up and down and walking around, around the office. Um, but for example, in a hospital environment, we could have a higher metabolic rate. So once we take into account the air speed, the air temperature, the humidity, the metabolic rate, the clothing levels, the globe temperature, we can calculate the thermal comfort indices, which are PMV or predicted mean vote, PPD or predicted percentage of the satisfied, and draft risk normally. There are a few more that we'll see at the end of this presentation. So to begin with the PMV, uh, what we have here is a thermal sensation scale. So the thermal sensation scale is a scale of minus three to plus three, in which zero means that a person would feel neutral with the environment. Minus one would mean that they feel slightly cool. Minus two um, would mean that they feel cool. Minus three would mean that they feel cold. And then on the other side of the scale, we would have one, two and three for feeling slightly warm with that environment, warm or hot with, with that environment. So if we asked a lot of people how they feel in an environment and, uh, and to vote on this scale, and we calculated the average, that would be the mean vote. And the predicted bit is because we do not ask people, but we predict how they are going to feel in advance. The next index that I'm going to talk about is the PPD or the predicted percentage of the satisfied. And as its name indicates, the PPD predicts the number of people who are going to feel uncomfortable in a certain environment. And as we can see here in, in this graph, PMV and PPD are related. So if people voted that they were feeling extremely hot in an environment or, or very cold in an environment, then 100% of the people would feel dissatisfied with this, with this environment. So it would be perhaps better to go back to design stage, for example, and, and review your design <clears throat> so that people will feel more comfortable with the, with the environment. And as the PMV approaches zero, then we see that the PPD goes down. But if you notice here, PPV is never 0% because there's always going to be a percentage of people who feel dissatisfied with the environment. Right, as I mentioned before, we can feel satisfied or unsatisfied with the environment, taking into consideration the body as a whole. And this is where the thermal comfort indices of PMV and PPD are important. But we can also have local discomfort. For example, if we feel a cold draft of air blowing, blowing down our neck, for example, because we are in the proximity of two supply grills that are clashing with each other and they're just dumping air on our, on our neck. So the draft risk calculates the percentage of people who are likely to be bothered by a draft. And this is normally when our uh, level of activity, our metabolic rate is less than 1.2 and is, is normally felt at neck level. The reason why um, we talk about draft risk when the metabolic rate is less than, than 1.2 is because uh, if, you, if you imagine the following situation, if we are in a very hot office where we are doing a lot of work and we put on a fan, we would be certainly be feeling a draft, but we will probably find that quite comfortable. Right, in here we can see other reasons why we can feel uh, uncomfortable with the environment, which are actually um, having a large vertical air temperature difference, 
warm and cold floors can make us feel um, local discomfort and also radiant asymmetry um, can cause discomfort. Radiant asymmetry is what we what we experience, for example, when we are close to to a fire, we would feel very hot on one side and very relatively colder on, on the other side, or when we're close to, to a cold window. So if there is an abnormally high temperature difference between the head and ankles up to eight degrees, there is a percentage of people who are also going to feel uncomfortable. And um, as I mentioned before, it affects more people who are um, at a at a light sedentary activity. And if the floor is too warm or too cold, the occupants could feel uncomfortable uh, due, due to the thermal sensation on their feet. And for people wearing uh, light indoor shoes, is the temperature of the floor rather than the material of the floor, uh, which, uh, which is important for comfort. And finally, on radiant asymmetry, uh, which can also cause, cause discomfort, People are most sensitive to radiant asymmetry caused by um, four aspects, which could be warm ceilings, cold ceilings, cool walls, or warm walls. So the, st the standard establishes formulas to calculate the, a predicted of the satisfied based on these factors of local comfort. But um, these calculations that we have gone through, they refer to steady state conditions. But in a real building, there are temperature variations due to, for example, uh, the influence, uh, the, the controls, for example. So how do these methods apply in a non-steady state thermal environment? So we can have three types of non-steady state conditions, which are temperature cycles, temperature drifts, or ramps, and transients. So Temperature cycles can occur due to the control of temperature in space. And if the peak uh, variation is less than, than one degree, the, the recommendations and the calculations that we have seen for thermal comfort can be used. Um, and then with temperature drifts or, or ramps, um, if, if the rate of temperature changes for lower than two degrees per hour, we can still use these, these methods. And uh, regarding transients, well, in general, the following statements uh, can be made. So a step change in the, in the operative temperature can be felt instantaneously. And after an up step in the operative temperature, the new steady state thermal sensation is experienced immediately. But following a down step in the operative temperature, the PMV and PPD values um, that we're going to measure are probably going to be uh, too high for the next 30 minutes until we acclimatize ourselves to the new to the new thermal conditions. And finally, what we can see here is uh, in the standard, um, there is a classification of, uh, of the thermal comfort results into three categories, A, B or C, based on the results of the PPD, PMV and draft risk. And even though this is not um, compulsory, um, this table, for example, could be used at contractual level. So designs would have to meet the requirements A or B or C of, of this table, for example. And finally, just note that there will always be a percentage of the satisfied occupants, but it's possible to specify environments that are going to be acceptable for, for a large percentage of the occupants. And um, it's often the same person who would be sen sensitive to different types of local discomfort. So for instance, a person sensitive to draft may be also sensitive to local cooling caused by radiant asymmetry or by a cold floor. So this is why the percentage dissatisfied values that we have calculated before um, should not be added because normally they will be referring to the same person. Right, so here we have some examples where we have measured thermal comfort at this area. We normally calculate um, the thermal comfort indices in, in mockups before uh, before a building is, is actually built, or we can go we can go on site. So as we see here on the left hand side, we were measuring the thermal comfort in, in a building that had um, a high a 
quite a high quite a high heat load because each person was using a very large amount of computers and, and screens. And on the left hand side, on the right hand side, we can see um, a study that we did on, on the thermal comfort in the supermarket aisle. So we were measuring other things rather than the thermal comfort only. Uh, we were also measuring the the duty of the of the uh, refrigerators and the temperature of the product, but we were also measuring the thermal comfort of um, several several people, either workers or visitors to to the supermarket. And in here, you can see other uh, two examples in which we also measure the the thermal comfort. This was a mock-up for uh, an office building in which we measure the thermal comfort of different ventilation systems. And on the um, left-hand side, you can see an isolation room where we measure the thermal comfort of the staff and the patients, um, whilst also doing other tests on pressure differentials, on the pressure stabilizers and on infection transmission. And here you can see an example of the results. So to finalize this presentation, we have seen how uh, in order to measure thermal comfort, we have to take into consideration the temperature of the air, the speed of the air, the relative humidity, the operative temperature or the globe temperature. We have seen how to calculate the thermal comfort indices of PMV and PPD. We also have to take into consideration the clothing levels and the metabolic rate, which is an indication of the activity that a person is doing. And finally, we have seen how uh, draft risk, radiant asymmetry, warm, warm or cold floors can also give us local discomfort. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for your attendance. And if you have any questions, I can answer to them if you send me an email at any time. Thank you very much. <laughs>